Hello and welcome to Love for the Lost Live. We're here tonight from 7 to 8. And our goal, our desire, our prayer is to help you, assist you in your spiritual walk, and to equip the body of Christ, that's the church, all those who belong to God by faith in Jesus, and to equip you with any necessary tools, spiritual weapons, spiritual insight, biblical wisdom, and how to share the gospel and live out your life in fullness in the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm so glad you've taken time to be here with us tonight. Any prayer requests or comments, concerns, you can phone one 855 917-3524, and we would delight to hear from you. You can also Skype CLA Radio number one, and you can also email me. I have an email, Mike at Soulwinners with a Z dot O R G. Mike at Soulwinners with a Z dot O R G. And there's also live chat on Facebook and Spreaker. Now, if you have a smartphone, like an iPhone, an iPad, an iPod, or an Android phone, you can enter 24 Sela Radio, 24 slash 7, in a search, and you can download a tuning app, and you can listen that way. Getting to be more and more popular way of listening to webcasts and podcasts using your mobile device, whether it's a tablet or a, whatever it is, phones, and lots of people are downloading and listening to webcasts and podcasts that way. Well, God bless you. Praise the Lord. I also want to remind you about our website, and that's found at www.rescuethelostministry.com. Actually, if you just Google Love for the Lost and you'll see in the Google search, it'll take you right to the web, web page. And there's lots of good information on that web page. All of our episodes are archived. And so you can download any one of those episodes and pass it along to friends, neighbors, whoever would benefit from the clear teaching of God's Word. And so we bless you to do that. And you can also check out past episodes. You, there's lots of good links on that web page that take you to other good teaching sites. There's a blog, there's a daily devotional, and there's even a CBN news feed so you can get all your daily news from a Christian perspective on that web page as well. And uh, we're trying to get set up so we can start promoting some books. Did you know that DJ Sam Rock has a book out? And I read it the other week, and what a blessing it is. Not a long book, but very, very good, significant material. Pastor Tim Rye, who was here several weeks ago, he has a book called Captive for Jesus, and I would love for you to get your copy of that and read that. Now, we'd have to charge you for that, but all of the proceeds will go to support his ministry. So God bless you. We're not quite set up with that yet, but we're working to that point. God bless you to go to that webpage and just check out all of the good information and it'll be a blessing to you and a strengthening time for you in your Christian walk. And you know, if you haven't made that commitment to Christ, you can look at that webpage and it can give you very, very clear evidence of why you should choose Jesus, why Jesus is the Savior of the world and he is asking us to trust him and to follow him for salvation. And really over the last several weeks we've been talking about that general theme of come follow me is what Jesus asked his disciples to do. We read that in the scriptures, but he's also giving us the same command, come and follow me. And discipleship, which is what that means, is to follow Jesus. It's not a matter of following the right rules, or just keeping a, a list of do's and don'ts. It's a matter of 
following Jesus, having that relationship with him. It's not tradition. Not all tradition is bad. Some tradition is very good and healthy. But some people get stuck on tradition, and they think that, you know, as long as they keep the traditions, they're good. No, God wants more than that. He wants you to have a living relationship with him, and that's always found through Jesus Christ. So that's been our general theme over the last several weeks, and we're going to continue that tonight as we talk about this topic, and the title is A Change of Heart, A Change of Heart. And what that really means is another word for that or another idea that would explain that phrase, a change of heart, would be the word repent or repentance. And when you're going in the wrong direction, you need to have a change of heart. You need to humble yourself and recognize that I am going in the wrong direction and I need to turn and move in the right direction. You know, it could be even be you know, you're driving down the road and you realize you're going the wrong way. You have to repent. And you may have to humble yourself and ask for directions and say, can you help me find the right way? And a kind, generous soul would hopefully point you in the right direction or give you the right directions and you would need to repent and turn around and start going the right way. Well, it is no different with us in the spiritual realm. We all need to have a change of heart. And I think that happens not only just on a a once-in-a-lifetime basis. I think that happens even on a daily basis, maybe on an hourly basis or a moment-by-moment basis where we need to repent of what our sinful heart is telling us, what our flesh is telling us to do, and we need to make that deliberate choice and move in the direction that God is calling us. Come and follow me were the words that Jesus gave to his disciples. Well, Many, many people are carrying a burden of guilt. And guilt is a very, very heavy burden to carry. And I would say at the outset that that is not an unusual concept in people's lives. And it's not even something that we should ignore because all of us really are guilty. But guilt is a very heavy burden burden to carry. You know, many times you might meet somebody and they might have a big smile on their face or they might even seem to have a very successful life. And you might look at them and say, boy, I wish I was that person. Or you might admire who they are or or their position. But very often behind that successful veneer or behind that smiling face, that person may be consumed by guilt, by a feeling of unworthiness or a feeling that they can't be forgiven, that no matter what they do, it'll never be good enough. And many times people try to deal with guilt in very different ways. Some try to ignore their guilt and they may try to hide their guilt. Maybe it's through drugs or alcohol or pursuing some pleasure, whatever it might be. It might be behind all of that activity. It might be a deep sense of guilt and shame that they're trying to cover up. It has an effect on our lives when we realize and recognize the guilt that we all carry. And all of us deal with it in one way or another, some healthy and some very unhealthy. Well, I often think of Peter and even Judas, these two men, both of whom, one betrayed Jesus and one denied Jesus. And how they dealt with their guilt and shame was very, very different. And we're going to be looking about at that a little bit tonight. And how they repented or addressed this idea of repentance was very different in each of their lives. You remember Peter said to Jesus, 
many times, at least twice that I know of, he says, you know, I will even go to death with you, Jesus. I'll die for you. I'll never disown you. I'll never turn away from you. But what was it that happened as soon as Jesus was arrested? We read in the scriptures and in the gospel accounts that all the disciples fled. And Peter was part of that group of the all who fled from Jesus. And then Peter came to the courtyard where Jesus was uh, handed over to the high priests. And in that courtyard, it was a chilly night, there was a fire, and he went to warm himself at the fire. And one of the servant girls said, I think I know who you are. You sound like a Galilean, and you were one of his disciples, weren't you? And not once, and not twice, but three times Peter denied that he even knew Jesus. And the heartbreak is that Jesus told Peter before it would happen that he would, in fact, deny Jesus. Peter couldn't believe that of himself. He couldn't believe that for all of his strength and all of what he thought was his ability, that he would deny Jesus. But that was the very thing that happened. Can you imagine the guilt that Peter felt over this situation? He had prepared himself in his flesh to defend Jesus. In fact, we read that he even took out a sword and cut off the ear of the high priest when they came to arrest Jesus. In his flesh, he was going to defend Jesus, but he discovered very quickly that it was more than just the flesh that was involved. It was, in fact, a tremendous spiritual battle, a battle that more than showed up outside of him, it showed up inside of him. And I just wonder if we don't recognize that same battle within ourselves. When Jesus was in the garden, three times the disciples fell asleep. He said, can you pray with me and watch for one hour? And three times Jesus came back, and all three times those disciples, Peter, James, and John, had fallen fast asleep. And he told the disciples, he said, you know, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And all of us can identify with that statement of Jesus. We have tremendous willingness to do God's work and to serve him and to live a godly life in our spirit. But very often, as soon as temptation comes or discouragement or whatever it might be, Fear, we find that the flesh is very weak. Even David, King David, you remember who he was from the Old Testament? Probably considered at least one of the two greatest kings of Israel. Maybe his son Solomon would be considered greater, but David was certainly a tremendous man of God. But even King David, a deeply spiritual and respected leader, fell morally. We read in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12 that not only did he commit adultery with Bathsheba, but he was responsible for having Bathsheba's husband, whose name was Uriah, killed. He told Joab, the commander of his forces, put Uriah to the front lines lines, so that when the battle gets thick and concentrated, that he will be killed. And so David was guilty of adultery. He was guilty of murder. He tried to cover up his sin. And he was known as a great spiritual leader and a respected leader, very spiritual man of God. In fact, God said, he's a man after my own heart. But yet even David fell morally. Sin is what he was guilty of. And he felt great guilt after he recognized under the ministry of Nathan the prophet what he had done. Sin will separate us from our relationship with each other, and it will separate us from our relationship with God. But oftentimes, you know, we are quick to minimize our sin by blaming other people. And we point the finger at everyone else And we refuse to accept our responsibility and our part 
in what is clearly something that we had a choice and a control over in the sense that we could turn away from that sin and rely upon God's power, grace, and mercy to help us. But often we try to blame our past or even our present situation in our lives on on other people, maybe our parents, maybe our friends, maybe the culture around us, maybe our working conditions. We try to blame these things on other people or other circumstances, and very often we refuse to accept responsibility for ourselves. Well, can I tell you that part of growing up, part of becoming mature, not only as a believer, but just as an adjusted, well-adjusted adult, is not blaming everybody else for the things that you are responsible for. And when you get to the point where you can say, you know, I share responsibility in this, and ultimately I make the choice, of course, with God's power and strength, that's a point of maturity when you can come to that point. And so we tend to blame others and ignore our part. But, you know, the scriptures reveal that there is an underlying problem that lies deep within us. Jeremiah 17.9 says this, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. What the great prophet Jeremiah was describing to us was the basic human nature. And he was saying that, you know, man is not good in, in of himself. He's not a morally responsible person. He is a person whose heart is deceitful above all things. And in fact, it is an incurable condition. It is beyond cure. So he's saying it doesn't matter how much economic development you pour into somebody, how much education, how much advantage you give someone, their heart remains the same. It is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Another way of putting it is found in Romans 3.23, where it says, you know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us has a sin nature. And we are sinners by choice, and we are sinners by nature. And that was what Jeremiah was communicating way back in the Old Testament days Jesus said also in Matthew 15, 19, he says, Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, and adultery. In other words, the real curse is the fact that we are separated from God because of our sin. And no amount of laws or standard of morality, no society, no organization, nothing you can do is going to change man's nature. All of us have a deeply seated evil lurking in the heart. And I think that is probably one of the best apologetics for Christianity, is looking at man's nature and seeing that it agrees perfectly. If you're honest with yourself, you'll agree that your nature is one of complete depravity before God. And in Christianity, the, the Bible is very clear about who we are before God. That, that might sound depressing. That might sound hopeless to you. But in fact, it's a great blessing to come to the point where you recognize your true nature before God and your true guilt before God. And then you begin to explore what he has done for you to rescue you to redeem you, to bring you back into that relationship that he desires for you. To be that disciple that Jesus said, come and follow me. It starts with that point of realizing that I am a wicked, evil person. I can't do anything to redeem myself. I need to do something beyond myself in order to find redemption. Well, Peter knew the consequences or the potential consequences of his actions when he denied Jesus on that night. He was just thinking of himself and trying to survive 
the danger of the moment. He had betrayed his trust and broke his bold promises to Jesus. And at that moment, there was no do-over. He could not take it back. His sin was his sin. His failure was his failure. I'm sure he was thinking over the next few days, was it too late? Has he been finally rejected in total by Jesus? Would Jesus still love him? Jesus had been dragged away without any protection and accused without defense and then put to death without the comfort of anyone other than his mother and John and a few who were there. Oftentimes our sins, our failures, have consequences and ripple effects in our lives and the lives of others. Now God forgives sin. He can forgive sin. He can wash us and make us clean. But very often the consequences of sin remain. And we can see, I'm sure if you look at your life, you can look at your life and say, you know, because of my wrong choices, because of my sinful choices, I can see the consequences that have been brought into my life. And God will forgive our sin, but he will not always, in fact, he probably most often will not remove the consequences of that sin. Why is that? because he wants us to learn to continue to depend upon him and to trust him, to remind us who we are and who he is. And so although he does forgive sin, there are consequences to the sin which often play out in a person's life even over the, for many years or generations. So forgiveness and consequences are two different things, or repercussions. God does not tolerate sin. He hates sin. God is a holy God, and nothing unholy or sinful can come into his presence. That is very clear from Scripture. He says, you shall be holy because I am holy. Jesus said, therefore, you shall be perfect just as your heavenly Father is perfect. And so because God is holy and perfect, and nothing unholy or imperfect can come into his presence, there is a God of not only love, but a God of justice. I can imagine that many times in the ministry of Jesus, in fact, I'm thinking of one in particular, Peter felt the rush of his own inadequacy when faced with a holy God. One time in Luke chapter 5 and verse 8, Peter fell down at the feet of Jesus and he said, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. When he realized who Jesus was, who the Messiah was, the holiness of God, the perfection that he was in, in the presence of, he was just overwhelmed. And he fell before Jesus and he said, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And how often, if ever, have you ever fallen on your face before God and recognized your true nature before him, just realizing the sin that's in your life and the unworthiness that's in your life? And when you're in that position, when you're in that place, you're the kind of person that God can use. I've heard it said that God can never use a man or, or a woman who is not broken. And what I think that means is he brings us to the point where we come to the end of ourselves and we realize, Father God, I have nothing to offer you. Would you please receive me? I am an unworthy person. I am not worthy of the slightest thing from you. Depart from me. But yet God shows us in that moment his love, his grace, and his mercy. Well, the Israelites had the same response. Remember back when they were out at Mount Sinai? And I'm going to read for you a retelling of the story from the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. When God told them to come to Mount Sinai because he was going to give them the law, and really it was a like a marriage contract is what he was doing at Mount Sinai. 
and he was going to give them the law. Here's what it says in Hebrews 12, verses 18 to 21 about that experience. It says, For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them any longer, for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. Here we see in this recounting of the Israelites coming to Mount Sinai that they came to the mountain with fear and with trembling. In fact, they begged Moses, don't show us the glory of God because we can't, we'll be killed. And when you come to that point in your life where you recognize who you are, an unworthy person, a sinful person, and who God is, a holy, perfect God who has every right to strike us down and needs to make no excuse for it whatsoever, When you come to that point of recognizing who you are and who God is, you're the person that God can work with. Realizing that you're unworthy, sinful, and that God is holy and perfect, and there needs to be some mediator between God and man. Isaiah, in chapter 6, when he saw the presence of God, you know, depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sin, or he recognized, I am a man of unclean lips. In Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, he himself, this great prophet, recognized his own unworthiness and sinfulness. Do you tonight fear the creator and ruler of the universe? The fear of God is a healthy thing. To fear God is a healthy thing. To recognize who you are and who God is and to have fear and trembling over that is a good thing. There are things that should concern us as we face God. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of this air, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. The Bible tells us that we were not just in need of a makeover, not just in need of, you know, strengthening. We were dead in our sins, in our transgressions. And we were by nature deserving of wrath. Because of who we are in our nature, God has every right to pour out his wrath upon us. Hebrews four twelve and 13 says, The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. You think you can hide something from God? Everything is in God's sight. Even your hidden thoughts and motivations, even the things that you aren't aware of yourself, God knows about you. That's why we take God's word and we let God's word divide as a double-edged sword, sword, the soul and spirit, the joint and marrow, the thoughts and attitudes of the heart, As we apply God's word to our life, it's like that double-edged sword that just is able to dissect and show us what our true motives and attitudes are. But we cannot hide anything from God. Everything is in God's sight, laid bare before him, to whom we must give an account. There will be a judgment of all people, a judgment time, and everyone will give an account of what he has done in the flesh, whether good or bad. That's what the Bible says. Matthew 25, 
31 to 33 and 41 through 46 says this, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, Jesus is going to return and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. How do you think your life would change today if you took these passages seriously? If you realize that by nature we are children of wrath, if you realize that we all must give an account to him, if you realize that there's going to be a judgment of the righteous and the unrighteous, the unrighteous to eternal punishment, the righteous to eternal life, would your life be different if you took these passages to heart and realized that you were going to face God one day and give an account of yourself and what your nature is really like? So often we look at other people and we say, you know, if only God would judge them, or if only they would pay for their crime or, or make recompense for what they have done wrong. And we demand justice or penalties for those who transgress the standards that, we've, that have been set, whether it's in society or in business or sports. We are quick to point the finger and accuse somebody of unfair play or unfair activity or breaking the law or you know, being unethical in a business relationship. We are quick to, to accuse them. But do we apply the same standard to ourselves? Do we demand justice for ourselves? So we see why often people struggle with this idea that justice comes from God. Because God is an impartial judge. Earthly judges, for as good and as integri- you know, filled of in- uh, with integrity as they may be, they are still only human judges and can only judge so, fair- so much so fairly. But God is a perfect judge who will perfectly judge everyone. You, me, everyone. So very often people struggle with the idea of justice for themselves when they are quick to ask for justice for other people. But God is going to judge all of us perfectly, impartially. And so our lives would be very different if we took these, just these three scriptures I just read. If we took them seriously, our lives would be very different as we realize that we need to make sure that we are doing things the right way and following God the way he he calls us to. Well, we talked a little bit about Peter, but I want you to think about Judas. Remember Judas was one of Jesus' disciples who literally betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And when Judas realized that what he had done was wrong, he was unable to handle the heavy burden of guilt that came upon him. He had sold Jesus into the hands of the enemy. The chief priests dismissed his pleas for help. He tried to return the 30 pieces of silver that he had taken to betray Jesus, and the chief priests refused to receive it back. Judas felt helpless. He felt very alone. And his solution was to end his pain by taking his very life. You read about that in Matthew chapter 27, verses 1 through 10. You know, he had a choice. He could have turned away from his sin, He could have repented. He could have asked for forgiveness and recognized who he was. But because he refused to release the burden of guilt and trust what God, you know, come back to God, Jesus said it is better for him if he had never been born. 
Can you imagine the Savior of the world saying that about Judas? He knew his eventual outcome, that he would take his own life because he felt hopeless and alone. And his solution to the emotional pain he felt was to kill himself, to hang himself. That didn't help him one bit. On the other hand, the chief priests and elders, those who had Jesus arrested and eventually crucified, they saw many of them, not all, but many of them saw no need to repent and no guilt. In fact, they were self-righteous. They were very convinced that they were doing exactly the right thing. Jesus said to them in Matthew 21, verses 31 and 32, he says, I tell you that tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. Even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Jesus is saying, you know, you may be in a better position than a tax collector or a prostitute. Tax collectors were despised in the culture of that day, not much different than today. And of course, prostitutes were looked down upon because of how they lived their lives. And Jesus is in fact saying that these people are getting into the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. God was not dismissing their sin, but what he was trying to, what Jesus was trying to explain to these Pharisees was that these tax collectors and prostitutes were repenting of their sin. They were turning away from their sin. Whereas the chief priests and many of the rulers and religious authorities thought they had no need of repentance. They thought they were living a good life and that God was pleased with them and they didn't need to confess a sin. So God, Jesus is saying, you know, repentance is a part of our everyday life when facing God. And he says, you see the example in these people and you still don't repent and believe in the one that God has, has sent. People are valuable to God. People are valuable to God. And he longs for us, for them, to return to him. Well, eventually, Peter, because he did repent and was restored to faithful service, he learned to appreciate this, and he wrote this about God's attitude towards sinners in Second Peter 3, 9. He says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. The accusation of the day was, where is Jesus' return? Why hasn't he returned yet? And Peter is saying, you know, God is not slow in keeping his promise. The Lord is not slow. You just don't understand things the way God understands things. Instead, his quote-unquote slowness, his tardiness, is in fact giving you a chance to repent. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3 9. So we see that God's desire is for us to recognize who we are, sinful creatures, to recognize who God is, a holy God, a perfect God a God who must judge sin because of his nature, and to recognize that God's patience with us leads us, gives us opportunity to repent. He is withholding judgment, waiting for many more to repent, those to turn away from their sin. So don't think that God is not paying attention or that he's not interested or that he doesn't know. God is patiently waiting for us to return to him, to repent, everyone, he, because we're so valuable. He loves us so much that he's giving us time. Let's talk about the nature of repentance, the nature of this new heart, a change of heart. Well, John the Baptist <clears throat> and Jesus as John the Baptist and Jesus began teaching, one of the common messages that people heard was this. 
The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Not only did John, the forerunner of Jesus, talk about the kingdom of God is here, repent and get ready, but Jesus himself talked about repentance, a change of attitude, a change of heart, and believing in the good news. It is not our natural response. It's not the natural response of our flesh to repent. Our natural response is to, as I said before, blame others, try to deflect guilt, try to rationalize what we've done, try to ignore it or redefine it. Repentance is not a natural response of our sinful nature, which is always with us, but it is a change of heart that's worked out by God himself. In fact, in 2 Timothy 3, it talks about how repentance is in fact a gift of God. So don't be brushing your fingernails on your shirt, you know, polishing your fingernails, thinking, getting proud because you think you've repented. Even the repentance that you demonstrate towards God is a gift that he gives to you. I wanted to read that for you, 2 Timothy 3. Actually, it's in 1 Timothy 3, sorry about that, where it talks about repentance. And it says that, um, praying that God will grant them repentance so that they may be uh, not ensnared, held captive to do the will of the evil one. And so we read that repentance is, in fact, a gift that God gives to us. It's not a natural response. When King David tr- tried to hide the sin, remember we talked about how he was guilty of murder and adultery, and he tried to hide his sin? What happened was Nathan the prophet, in 2 Samuel 12, 11 and 12, and 12 is where they talk about Nathan the prophet, he comes And he very skillfully begins to interview David. And he says, you know, David, there's this person who had a sheep taken from him. Now, you know, the the person that took the sheep had a whole flock full. But they saw, they, they you know, they wanted this sheep this person had, and they went and they took it from him. And David becomes furious. And he says, who is that person? Bring him to me. He will do it no longer. And Nathan says, you know, you are that man. You have all these women, all these wives that you're married to. Not that God condones that, but he permitted it during that time. And yet Uriah has one wife, and you go and take his wife. You are that man. And what does David do? This is why he's a man after God's heart. He doesn't try to deny it. He doesn't try to explain it away or redefine it. He doesn't blame someone else. He immediately says, I have sinned. Now, God did not remove the consequences of that sin. The son that was conceived and born through that adulterous relationship between David and Bathsheba, that son died. And in fact, David's whole family was affected by his sin of adultery with Bathsheba. And so God did not remove the consequences of that sin, but he forgave David because he repented. He immediately confessed that sin and did what he could do, humanly speaking, to make it right. We see King David's prayer of repentance in Psalm 51, and let me just read some of it to you. He says in Psalm, in fact, this would be a good prayer for you to read. Maybe tonight you're guilty of some great sin. Maybe tonight you recognize before God that you have sinned grievously against God and you just have this burden of sin in your, in your life and you're repenting of your sin. I would encourage you to take this Psalm 51 and make it your prayer. Make it your prayer to God, praying the scriptures back to God where he says, have mercy on me, O Lord, according to your unfailing love, According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. 
For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, God, you will not despise. As you read those words of David, as he prays this prayer of repentance, evaluate what David's words reveal about sin, about his sin, and even about your sin. And think about the things that he seeks from God. And why that is important to him. David's not asking, you know, remove the consequences of the sin. He's saying, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. In other words, may I still have that close relationship with you. And David recognizes that even though he had sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah, that ultimately all sin is against God. And so he recognizes that he had offended a holy, righteous God. And God had every reason to judge him, but he was crying out for mercy and forgiveness to this God of heaven, looking for forgiveness, mercy, and cleansing during this time of repentance. Sometimes, you know, we think we have it backwards. We think we have to do something. We think we have to prove ourselves before we can approach God, that we have to get ourselves cleaned up. And then we'll, then we'll go to church, then we'll approach God, then we'll start serving God, that we have to have something of worth that we can bring to God. But you know what David says? The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. David could bring nothing to God, just like you and I can bring nothing to God. We can't add anything to God. He is sovereign. He needs nothing from us. The sacrifices of God are a broken and a contrite spirit. When you come to the place of brokenness, of repentance, then you become the man or the woman whom God can use, whom God can say, you know what? There's a person who recognizes who they are, and who recognizes who I am. Now I can start. And he says, you know, Jesus says in Matthew 11, he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Come, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. We need to come to Jesus. We need to come to God with our brokenness, with our sin, with our guilt, and lay it before God's feet and just cry out to him for mercy and forgiveness. Repentance is a change of heart, a change of mindset, recognizing the horrendous nature and effects of sin and saying, I want nothing more to do with it. I want God's forgiveness and a restored relationship with him. And no denial, 
no excuse, no trying to justify actions or blame, just recognizing what we have done and recognizing who God is. Peter himself despaired of his own ability and recognized he could not do this without God. He could do nothing without God. And he wound up depending solely upon him, his mercy and his love. So godly repentance grasps how much our sins cost Jesus and his saving love that washes them clean. Did you know there's a difference between godly repentance and worldly repentance? Peter had a godly repentance. Judas had a worldly repentance. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, we read this very thing about this, these differences between godly and worldly sorrow. And here's what Paul writes in those verses. He says, even if I caused you sorrow by my letter. Now, Paul was referring to a letter that he had written to the church, which was known as the severe letter. And he had to chastise the church for some of its error and its sin. And so he says, this letter that I sent caused sorrow. But he says, even if it caused sorrow, I don't regret it. And why is it? Because your sorrow led to repentance. So there's a difference between just being sorry for something and repenting. You can be sorry for something and not repent. You're sorry you got caught, or you're, you may be genuinely sorry, but you don't repent of that sin. And so, so Paul is saying that the letter that he sent, the chastisement that he gave this church, caused sorrow, but that that sorrow then led to repentance, a change of heart, a change of mind. And he says, goes on to say in these verses, 2 Corinthians 7, 9, and 10, he says, For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation, and wor but worldly sorrow brings death. Your enemy wants you to become involved in worldly sorrow versus godly sorrow. And so the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow is this. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to life, leads to salvation, leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. We see the example of that in these two personalities that we've been talking about tonight. Peter, who denied Jesus and had great sorrow over that, but that sorrow led to repentance, and that repentance led to salvation and Peter, once he received the Holy Spirit, became a tremendous apostle, a tremendous asset to the church and to God. Whereas Judas had sorrow, but his sorrow did not lead to repentance. It led to suicide. And so the enemy wants you to have a worldly sorrow instead of a godly sorrow. It's not saying that sorrow isn't good. There's a purpose for it. But the purpose for, the, for sorrow is to lead to repentance. And I wanted to read for you also from 2 Corinthians, uh, that chapter 7, where it talks about how this godly sorrow, uh, it says in verse 11, For observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. And he says, What diligence it produced, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In other words, this godly sorrow that led to repentance produced in these, this church, the Corinthian church, a real zeal, a real enthusiasm to serve God. And so when you see somebody who really is on fire for Jesus, it's because they've grasped, maybe they don't even comprehend all of the intricacies of it, but they've grasped this idea of repentance that leads to salvation. 
They are just so thankful. They realize what God has done for them, how God has forgiven them of their sin, that they just can't do enough to serve God. Are you in that situation tonight? Do you realize what God has done for you, what Jesus has done for you? He has literally given his life in your place, paid for your sin, paid your penalty on the cross with his sacrificial death so that you could be spared being punished by God, the rightful wrath of God. Oh, hallelujah, when we realize what God did for us, what Jesus did for us, how could we not have a godly sorrow that leads to repentance, that leads to salvation, and then we are just serving God, not out of obligation, but out of great joy and thanksgiving. Whereas worldly sorrow is something that ultimately leads to death. Now, it may not necessarily be suicide, but it could be the death of a relationship. It could be, you know, the end of something that you've uh, pursued for you know, a season, whatever it might be. But worldly sorrow is something that leads to death. Don't get caught up in worldly sorrow. Get caught up in godly sorrow and let godly sorrow have its perfect work in you. Well, think about these verses and how they might help you as you address sinful attitudes, actions, or maybe sinful lifestyles of a person you know, maybe it's yourself, maybe it's a friend. Think about these verses and how we need to apply them to our lives and to encourage others to think about them for themselves as well. Fleeing to the God of hope. Alienation from God caused by our sinful nature cannot be solved by looking within ourselves. Isn't that where the problem started to begin with? A self-focus, you know, self-love. That's where the problem starts. The sinful nature, looking within ourselves. How can we please the flesh? Well, how can we be saved? Matthew 19 says this, it says, With man it is impossible, but all things are possible with God. You cannot save yourself, but God can. He can lift the burden of guilt by what he has done for us. Here's what it says in 1 John 1, nine. It says, If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 1 Peter 1, 18-21 For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors but with the precious blood of Jesus a lamb without blemish or defect he was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16. Here is a trustworthy statement that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst, But for that very reason I was shown mercy that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Ephesians 2, 4-9 Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Let's put into practice what we've think what we've discussed tonight, this idea of 
repentance, a change of heart, a change of mindset. Think about Psalm 51. Maybe even memorize some of those phrases and pray them back to God. And determine who else needs these words of hope. And maybe pick out some ideas, some scriptures that you can share with them. Trust Jesus. Repent. Receive the gift of eternal life. And then come follow Jesus as he invited all his disciples to do. God bless each one of you. May the Lord bless you. Talk to you soon.